Hi, 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 everybody. Good evening, and welcome to Dia, and welcome to the readings in contemporary poetry. I am Jasmine Raymond, and I'm Dia's curator, and I'm one fourth of the brain behind this program because there's many things, uh, many people who are involved in the creation uh, of this program. Um, as many of you know, the series, uh, poetry series that Dia dates back to the days when Dia was across the street on 22nd Street, and um, it, was run, it ran for many years until 2003, and when Dia sort of relocated its programs to Beacon, New York, Dia Beacon, um, the program went on a pause. But of, Last year, um, maybe about a year ago, right, Vincent? I don't know any more time. Um, we were having dinner, Vincent and I. Have been, uh, Vincent and I know each other for, for a few years. Um, and we were casually talking about uh, poetry and art and the artists that we admire and that we thought had um, great connections with the poetry and the poet community and, and with poetry. And, after a few drinks and a handshake, uh, Vincent, Katz, and I joined forces, and with the help of Christine Howe, a poet who works also at DIA, um, we come up with this um, series, and um, I'm very thrilled. The turnout, as we see tonight, it's, the community has responded very positively, and we are continuing. And I have to thank a few people for that. I would like to start by thanking Barbara and Charlie Wright, and, and an anonymous donor who made, for their generosity, because they made this series possible. Closer to my desk, again, Christine Howe, my colleague and friend, and for her professionalism and care in coordinating this series. Patrick Hailman, right there behind the column, who is our technical wizard, and um, he records the series uh, for DIA and, and for our archive. And I would like to say a few words about Vincent Cat because um, he's a, a thinker, a poet, a writer, a translator, a curator. <laughs> he's many things. He wears many hats. And um, it's been delightful to work with Vincent on this series. He's the author of numerous books, uh, nine books on poetry, including Cabal of Cialot, Understanding Objects, and Rapid Departures. He won the 2005 National Translation Award given by the American Literary Translators Association for his book and translations from Latin, The Complete Elegies of Sextus Propertus. And he was awarded the Rome Prize Fellowship in Literature in the American Academy in Rome from 2001 to 2002. He had one month residency at the American Academy in Berlin in the spring of 2006, and he's the editor of the poetry and arts journal Vanitas. And besides poetry, Vincent and I talk a lot about art, and he's become almost an, uh, my um, part-time colleague idea, like the, the one that doesn't share a desk. So um, it's not only the series, what he has helped me tremendously, but also um, in general, my uh, relocation to New York. So I'm thankful to him, and I would like to leave him to introduce tonight's poets. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmil. That was very sweet. Um, and the feeling is mutual. I just want to remind everyone that the next reading in our series, which will be the last one this season, is on April 21st, a Thursday also. And it will be Michael Lally and Brenda Ajima. So please put that in your calendars. Paolo Javier will read first, then we'll have a short break, followed by John Ashbery. Paolo Javier is the 2010 to 2013 Queens Borough Poet Laureate. He's the author of four chapbooks and three full-length poetry collections, including The Feeling is Actual, Marsh Hawk Press, coming out later this year. He curates two reading series, Projections, dedicated to live film narration and performance, and Queen's Poet Lore, a roving poetry series set across the borough. He edits Second Avenue Poetry, which you can find at secondavenuepoetry.com, a press of innovative language art, and he lives with his wife in Queens. 
There is always something familial, community-based about Paolo and his poetry, so that when he takes those wild flights of fancy, and he do, you have the safety net of knowing that everything is going to be cool. Paolo and his poetry will catch you before you crash. The first section of the first poem in his 2004 collection, The Time at the End of This Writing, has a meditative rhythm appropriate to the season, but the wit also causes the lines to snap, to steal a word from the poem's title. Yellow leaves fall on the sidewalk, so the store clerk sweeps. Yellow leaves tumble past my weeds. My landlord emerges yellow in a gold Camry. Down a camera creek of Mercury's a sleek continental glides. Content in a rental, with a panda on his back, a man passes. He makes a pass, pauses, the sun in his mouth. He has hurt teeth. Off yellow, fall. Trees leave. The store clerk weeps. The rhythms of language, but also of a daily life, of occurrences and past situations, particularly those engendered by birthright. There is always in Paolo's poetry a sense of who he is. He identifies himself or sees how others identify him. He questions it, aided by a sense of humor. Paolo is invested in sound, and hearing him read is an intensely oral experience, which is what first drew me to his work. As I got to know it better, I realized his is a multidimensional approach, drawing on the visual arts, popular forms, theater, and other brands of performance, not to forget the occult with which he is deeply invested. He's written a few perfect poems. One is The Room in Tina's Room, which starts out sexy, turns elegiac, and ends, take a bow, then write about it in a poem, write poems, that's my right. He's right about that, and we are the lucky beneficiaries. In his 2005 book, 60 Love Bombs, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is that right? Yeah. Looks like it could be Love Bombs also. Paolo's poetry becomes more fragmentary, picking up velocity as it goes. Larger spaces between words indicate a breathlessness that is almost suffocating, but he is never at a loss for sound refractions. My gusts of candor call for statements to come defend as his poem, The Shame, begins. In Paolo's latest publication, The Feeling is Actual, he writes, I've been a grand gesture guy in the past, and in all likelihood, I will continue to be one in the future. He hits the big notes in this collection, sex, romance, even aging and regret. The poetry often comes in the form of prose, as the discussion of a play or movie takes the place of life, the characters, you and I. Humorous investigations both abroad, Philippines, and at home, Queens, and visual poetry in which comics collide with opaque found texts. Quote, he said he was interested in humiliation, so I stood him up, quote. <laughs> All this with a multicultural vantage, which comes to the fore in later sections, abetted by found images and typography. If I'm like a piece of bok choy, then you are probably a piece of broccoli. It's just a communication thing. Listen to this poet, watch him, lap it up. Please welcome Paulo Javier. Patrick, I may need to call on you in a second. How's everybody doing? Wet? Wet, yeah. I'm wet too. Can you hear me fine in the back? Is this close enough to the mic? If you can't hear me, just say so. Um, thank you so much, uh, Vincent, for inviting me uh, to be a part of um, this really distinguished series, uh, as I understand it from Charles Bernstein. Um, Dia has done this also in the past, so uh, on that note, I wanted to also thank Dia for really supporting poetry and for supporting poets. Uh, thank you, uh, Jasmeel and Christine, and also Patrick for making tonight possible. Um, and uh, I'm really honored to be reading with Mr. Ashbery. Uh, 
I was trying to come up with some things to say, and all I could come up with is, it's really dreamy, you know? <laughs> so, so. Is the projector on? The perils of technology. Oh yeah, I act like I don't own a Mac myself, you know. Okay. Maybe I'm all of this. Pinch me into sexy, simple edifice of your crown. Pinch me into sexy until the higher rose matter lends hay. Palpable buttons to choose from this season. I'm wearing unsentimental Antigone, incest reneged. Pinch me into sexy in prolific commas, harmonies, eloquent, a vintner of your life embrace, hunky lamenter conceived by a pair of litigated omniscience, O oh, constant pinch, sigh in all brute liberty, equal gaze resounding in warp speed. O oh, ocean love for miles on solid, from your lost supplicant restrained in mud, restrained in mud. whose fingernails ache. I appear questing, restored. I assign acid to level conquistadors outnumbered. A lusty tournament pollen, a rucksack I doth annihilate. Not lasso indeterminate comeuppance ululation, a seance erasing elfin commodity. Must I appear nautilus arm in arm, unserviceable male pedigree parable, Boying a pair of catalpa set in library, delays one cinema, deshelled nude, lactating glandular, appending patronymic, said the jaguar disguised, none such allows to defile an otter. Odin, I'll invent, deshelled nude, appear in porn, cock excused in mauve abundance, the mauve abundance I'll handwrite, so Sydney, Oregon, or Lent, Azaleas, O oh daughters, question innocent goodbye of cardinal saints. I'll veer away from scat, Odin's arms attached. Formal apology to my asshole. Manananggal yun, di ba? Serial attendant chupacabra. Lacan on par with desperate cardiac likeness, carnivorous in deeper cellar. O oh, cat lion, essential entrances, Ovid only, arbors, a lead summit saddle, soft bellies and herborous, a leper polyp not in a quarry, tipples emphasis, I sell back tarantados, Dadaist, I sowed grafts onto variant belief, veto neologism, epilogue, leper polyp, epilogue, revolve, octave. O oh, antsy Nazi, how you deter desolation jaunts, to the contrary come up simpering, a sum of all your garish stench of a lion right out of the voice. Fascist look angelic to recover face. Am I the turn of the rose adventurous, communique lackey required? Communique lackey to rat on prayers, say calcified to dash off our differences? Am I the reliquary they ought to dismember in turn? Quick ambassador in alien to an importune, held, mock, undue humiliation. Am I the reliquary you beam us dour discipline, bouquets and jade sorties, dismal anger agreement, to dash off a restrained resolution in tin foil, a common voyeur recorder lead, all meager seniors touch? In a nutshell, hard to read. I'm in an auto industry arteried with curator viscosity, torn and dismembered ambassador, consecrated indiscretion. 
Where is love? Here, dismember, conscious, entrenched, I unpeel by rote a public diary. My nether gorgon. I'll finally feel less adversity, less disjunct, often a loss by distance. All sober leche of lusty new murder, suffering. I feel I'm precious supine on the solid deck. I'll rebuff, I'll sucker, a decade unravels, disheveled since Americanization, seeding lascivious spasms to the importuning, compulsive, purview male habituate, ah, sonar for dorsal fin on the moon deck. I am who most agreed, tipples to scansion, said unsure I appeal, say I enlarge dementia, say I in zeal, hasten a shrieking in toilets to last me infinity. So verbose these molesters resorting to plan, I'll pour tar, pending entrances of musty cellar pets, loss as a scalpel, conscious of satiety, colors zero scent, dusky islands Guinevere erases, hastened lost islands Guinevere erases, telos, conscious of intemperate depravity feel, Telos, O oh, temperate dorsal fin, a tall tail, bloodletting rodents imperil those plains of their future plans. Squander inanimate grief, I'll duly relate alone, fallible calendar crescendos. Vanishing viands intensifies all filial of adherence. Hasten the lust there, dorsal fins, I enlist borders. Gascan, croqueta, y calawa. I stink of ripe otter. Shit. Yay, a sail. Reeking of Spanish rope unlaid. A bridal fabric denuded in Korea. Gehring, on cue, sends no letter inserting Bermuda. But this means, naturally, visitors. Soy sauce. Not when an arrow has its duke. Terror, a case I involve us indeterminate. A room key knocks on my door. A Medellin cocksuck inserting Bermuda. Tiraan mo nitong durakong sinilbing A. A projectile question desire is a career. Appaloosa, Appaloosa B. Infinity is escape. Trojan relic, less animal, vital. No digging it, Trojan relic, less animal, vile. Hello, Aria, Aria. 666 bombs later calculated. Rumble in Queens, Terpsichord reach, chance, or it chose us. Led us to you, O serpent inimical, injured infidel in Tin Pan Alley. Who comes to us in love, Helix? Who comes looking in vain for the same sworn enemy? Whose come adjusts the medium. Remedial cuckold, ruins, deicide, mobile lyric, autumn churn. A yelp, I'll hasten the chorus to cue Orpheus. Same old success later will bear it. Elied, impoverished Milus, the stench of a gringo in firmament. Azalea and Rose, U.S. grants as such. One thousand reliquaries. I hasten the miasma in plumage. Conquering scribe, rope, ultimate truncheon, terrain I trust rely on as prescient U.S. terrain, I trust valorous. Jason and the Aranath. He almost heard us sully the hour I know he attended. Sound of lead serum, such orbs old rope imagined. Water in silver in supplication murder. Retardant U.S., a rap ethnography sophically sold to envision by rote referendum a new cafe New Yorker panders. Murder. Hate gallops the duration of delusion as lewdly. Hi! Acetate enemy new cafe. Kitchen of obscurity where armor of missionary turntable alleged elation ornament meat versal lay. Hogarth the appropriate leopard barbecue egg essay ode quandary. Torn tenor a book will do what Brian Cugnot's L.A. 
armor appropriated heads of new Escher Rome, adieu to our distant necessity, in case they prohibit these estimates unto dull palaver solely chooses solid Iliad hand one Y chromosome. How could I have had a nothing lunch, pork instant in a sack of sun? I see Cugnot's disgraced world-led undelegated receding Oedipus, U.S. Knox speech hobbling conscious canards, state senate sorority allegories lead Franco's concubines knocking on my solo valve so Dewey Champions League rope busy the Zion port. Annals of rope edict retinal lid rotten unborn imago verisimilitude. He almost heard us hug. Nickel and diming, tedious zombie infrastructure, reeks of the unproductive monument in Canaan, a heart east of the equator, O moon, war Edo denounces as more rape under rope, bionic dizzy dizzy economy odometer recipe, Canaan as hero requires jealousy sequestered, Augur Isao, a jaunt Ezra affirms, Kanya art extra, non grata salinia ni Darby Gillis, dead as he leavens it, a parallel past in the first person. How you guys doing? Maybe I misses you. Hello, my love, estuary. I choose to quell my busy cockroaches, pure ray on my fantail, innumerable murderer. Oh, your quartered gorgeous, somber as ambrosia, I meant to map a planet in defense, Eaterim. Your indigenous lasted us here, lucent summits. My goal, to quell atriums, oh, my arresting and auditory love. In a trance, oh, I read a civil heart rope cadence. Cue your engine late in equal act to lay low. Hey, inlay serenade minus recent sadism. How inadvertent I do elaborate. I pull you to low tainted vistas. Hastening in lunch a cruder, somber, hastened, elegant malaria. Rome, a dearer ulcer unwrit. Race, a minor key near our bionic marina, narrates saucy syrup eruption. I knock any inquiry recompense. Certain mitigating circumstances hoist me to call a cello, caterpillar, Breton, Chianti, a key diary involving equal abhorrent murder. I dream in point of paradise. The latter 32 reflections of secular unrest, brazen, Sonorous, abhorrent, a wrap-up intensely hostile and richly selecting in bits of duality, in the end rated anonymity, saintly repairs no Sybarite in Dallas would sell. Disco sunset. I'll board the one sepulchral flotilla, trace currents of Arius lowed in Orlando, lowered in Orlando on Mars. I'll undo esplanade leader required, enlarge for posterity's aplomb. I'll connect the negative of your hand or dip it in a Saturday's grab bag of rain, renounce exegesis, sorrow deepens in me. I'll board the one sepulchre removed, seal jaundice in the marrow contending with the moon. Okay, uh, let me just catch my breath. You can too as well. Um, I just read a, a selection of poems from a bestiary that uh, was published by a press in Astoria, Queens, I just press, and I just wanted to thank uh, Mark Lamoureux for um, keeping an open mind. I myself did not draw these, uh, make these illustrations. Uh, it's actually um, made by a, a good friend of mine and a frequent collaborator, Ernest Concepcion, who's based in, uh, in Brooklyn. Thank you all again for coming tonight. I'm gonna close with a, um, a section from my forthcoming book, The Feeling is Actual, 
Uh, many thanks to Tom Fink and Marshawk Press for uh, taking a chance on my book. Thank you so much, Vincent, for the kind words. Um, man, I haven't thought about those poems in a long time. Uh, as you will, well, maybe you don't know, but I'm the Queen's Poet Laureate, and it, when I was installed, I was actually officially installed as Queen's Poet Laureate. You know, recognized. Uh, and you know, it was, it was kind of trippy. They, they, they named a day after me when they did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, a lot of the papers, community papers, I mean, the way that they framed the press release, they made me seem like a lot more significant than I really am and a lot more talented than I really am. And one of the total mistruths that they included in, that several of the newspapers included in my biography is that I'm a filmmaker. I have friends who are filmmakers, so I know better than to ever claim that I'm a filmmaker, okay? Having said that, uh, <laughs> Here's Monty and Turtle. Can I um, kill the lights? <clears throat> How do you frame a memory? It's a question that burns throughout Wong Kar Wai's cinema. And of his nine feature films, all astonishing in their beauty and formal daring, there's none I can better remember than Happy Together. For one, I love how the film's synaptic rhythms enact the discarded feelings of its characters, how its style and love story weren't intellectualized into being or even planned, how both were less about choice or concept and more about organic or not imposed. You follow your instincts for what's possible in this space and what two people in this situation are most likely to do. This is your coat. Sorry. Excuse me. No prob. Sorry I fell asleep on it. I'm Monty, by the way. Terrible. Sometimes I forget my own name. It's okay. I forget mine all the time, too. Well, it's nice to meet you. When people ask, how did we meet, I tell the truth. Kim's party at Tangerine, seconds after I decide to leave it, descending fog of malicious exes, swept away by the sudden gale of your laugh. <coughs> when he began Happy Together, Wong Kar Wai only had two characters in mind, Tony and Leslie's. He'd managed to find a city to put them in, but nothing else. What did they feel when they came to Argentina? Did they know it would be so cold in the summer? In improvisatory filmmaking, solutions always present themselves at the very last minute. Maybe they aren't even real solutions, but something always turns up to solve the problem. The idea is to tell the story of these two people, but because of time limits, Wong knows he can't make a film about two people. So what you doing? It's a one-winged bird. It's kind of flying this way. I guess it's a mallard. How can you tell its head? Uh, it has a beret right here because it's a surrealist. Great. Just what we need. More foo. No. Everything is a little bit mumble, 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 mumble. On our first date, you suggested Lily Forever, a film about an Estonian teenager who was abandoned by her mother, forced into white slavery, then commits suicide. What were you thinking? <laughs> Despite the film, it was such a gas to walk up University Place with you, especially when you offered me a bag of dried mangoes to eat. Why? Because I'm Filipino, I teased. You were so embarrassed. Thankfully, our second film, which we both knew was a comedy in advance, made up for the first one, A Mighty Wind by Christopher Guest. I remember how you and I kept rolling in our seats over the recurrence of the Cabana Boy character, a Filipino extra whose sole function was to smile broadly for the camera in each scene. Watching him play with gusto such a transparently token person of color in the movie was absurd to the point of hilarity. 
The five or so other people in the theater kept motioning to shut up, but it was too late. Giddiness had taken over, would bind us forever to that moment's character. Both of these films ended up being the only ones we'd catch until the fall when we decided to give it another shot. The next would be Lost in Translation by Sofia Coppola, a movie whose cinematography draws heavily from the style of Christopher Doyle, Wong Kar Wai's go-to DOP. And much like Wong's film, Coppola's luxuriates in the themes of dislocation and closeness versus the impossibility of love, in dynamism versus the need to hold on. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Hove, H to the O-V. I used to move snowflakes by the O-Z. Robert Rauschenberg said you're not an artist if you can't walk a block and come up with five new images and even more ideas. Edward Steichen said you can photograph a world in your room. And later, Robert Frank and Keiichi Tahara showed us how to. Chris Doyle finds a stairway, an entrance, a wall he likes. He starts to get a feel for the kind of characters who would use such a space. So he has fun turning the camera on and off at will to generate the effect of random spontaneity, like a series of Polaroid snaps that skip through time and disregard any continuity. You know I could use a ride up to my residency next month. It's up in the valley. Pretty. Mm-hmm. What do you say? Most deaf. <laughs> Happy Together and its characters are all out of time and out of space. And Tony and Leslie struggle to repair their relationship in the most difficult reality. As gay Chinese nationals in a xenophobic country, neither one can fluently speak the language. Um, this is uh, my friend Monty. Monty. Hi, this is uh, Yoshimi. Wow, you look great. Are you still um, making images? Mumble, mumble, yes, no. My finger doesn't unpress um, like this. Oh, too bad. Are you mumble, mumble, still in culinary school? Yes, yeah, still, you know, cooking away. Wow, that's great. Are you mumble, mumble? Tony and Leslie's interiors are consciously timeless, not logically lit. Tony keeps a souvenir lampshade of Iguazu Falls. The light passing through the holes in the cylinder make the water painted on the plastic shade part seem to cascade downward. Chris Doyle once claimed his best films were made when he was saddest and just out of love. He was very much in love when he began Happy Together, so he assumed his then relationship with Denise wouldn't end so good. She tells him, it hurts, but I have to leave you. At least I know now you'll make a better movie. The clouds moving the shadows across the road in random patterns, the traffic and what's happening on the roadside all affect the shot. Mix a dash of experience with a lot of intuition and try to think ahead, Doyle insists. All I know is how I see the space and what I hope to do with it. In the valley that summer, I lived in my artist studio. I focused on work, staying up late and crashing on the floor. I wanted to defamiliarize myself, move out of certain spaces, preconceptions of the world, I knew so well. 
Chris Doyle writes how he would always associate the blurred action sequences in his other films with Wong Kar Wai with the adrenaline rush that fear or a violent act excites. In Happy Together, it's more druggy, the speed changes marking decisive, epiphanal, or revelatory moments. The actor moves extremely slowly while all else goes on in real time. The idea is to suspend time, to emphasize and prolong the relevance of what's going on. About a month after the blackout, you and I got back together. Eight years now and counting. I think about the ending of Wong's film shortly after Tony's character wakes up from a long sleep in Taipei, the city of your birth. He decides to visit Chang at their stall in the Liaoning night market, but discovers his friend's family instead. In voiceover, Tony reveals, I finally understood how he could be happy running around so free. It's because he has a place he can always return to. Thank you. Welcome back. Well, it's a great, great pleasure to welcome John Ashbery back to DIA. He's read here, I believe, twice before, in 1987 and in 1993. The first time he read on his own, and the second time he read with Pierre Martori, whose poetry he has translated uh, on three occasions, I believe, three books of poetry of Pierre's. What had you been thinking about? The face studiously bloodied, heaven blotted region. I go on loving you like water, but there is a terrible breath in the way all of this. You were not elected president, yet won the race, all the way through fog and drizzle. When you read, it was sincere, and the coast stammered with unintentional villages. The horse strains, fatigued, I guess, the calls, I worry. These are the opening lines from John Ashbery's poem, The Tennis Court Oath, from the book of that name, published in 1962, heard repeatedly on a record and committed to memory. <laughs> the sound of J.A.'s poetry coming from a recording on one of John Giorno's dial -a poem records. Its phrases entered directly into the consciousness with no mediation of thought or logic, or there was only necessary the logic of the words, their sounds and phrases that functioned like musical phrases. It all made a most marvelous giddy sense that of course could never be paraphrased or synopsized. It could only be described in the most bland terms possible. I remember in high school, an English teacher who liked Ashbery's work and often included it in our discussions. But bound as he was to determine what a given poem was about, he was fated to accept the dull conclusion that all Ashbery's poems were about the same thing, the meaninglessness of modern life. <laughs> the sound of his poetry, especially if you could hear it aloud, assured you the opposite was true. I remember at John Ashbery readings in the 1970s that it was not considered appropriate to laugh at the hilarious juxtapositions one heard. People were listening intently, trying to figure out what exactly the great poet was saying. Sometime after that, people realized that laughter is an appropriate response to some of the poetry's disjunctive qualities. In fact, the same lines can engender very different responses in different listeners. It seems that poetry's ability to give delight is in direct proportion to the delight the poet experienced while writing it. If that is the case, then Ashbery must have had a lot of fun. Ashbery's work has been hugely influential, partially because of its 
clearly defined stylistic shifts. The tennis court oath from 1972, for instance, is largely composed of sentence fragments. While this would not remain a characteristic of his poetics, it was a brave laying bare of an attitude towards sentences. The collage approach that marks his poetry, the combining of pieces of language from diverse sources into a linguistically unified rhetoric is tour de force writing, and it remains stunning today. With three poems from 1972, Ashbery invented a new kind of poetry, one mainly written in prose. The beginning of the first poem, called The New Spirit, could be an aesthetic map for a generation or so. Quote, I thought that if I could put it all down, that would be one way. And next, the thought came to me that to leave all out would be another and truer way. Some of the poem Coma Berenices, again written in prose from the book Where Shall I Wander, 2005, is devoted to that kind of typically Ashburyan text that hovers tantalizingly between the silly and the profound. Quote, the snowball is a model for the soul because billions of souls are embedded in it, though none can dominate or even characterize it. In this, the snowball is like the humblest soul that ever walked the earth. And yet, the poem ends on a distinctly flat tone. Whether one takes it as philosophical or gloomy depends on the listener. Quote, all in all, this has been a fairly active and satisfying year, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Where it will take me, I do not know. I just hang on and try to enjoy the ride. Snow brings winter memories. There is a warning somewhere in this, but I do not know if it will be transmitted. John Ashbery has had an active interest in theater, writing and publishing plays. He has been prolific as an art critiker, an art critic, excuse me. <laughs> well, hey, I'm in the mood. An art critic, an editor, or an edit and critiker of arts publications. <laughs> you know German. His translations have added significantly to our knowledge of modern French poetry. And taking a deep breath, he has won many prizes and honors, including a Fulbright Fellowship, selection by W.H. Auden for a Yale Younger Poets series, a Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize, the Bollingen Prize, two Guggenheim Fellowships, a MacArthur Fellowship, and the International Griffin Poetry Prize. Please welcome John Ashbery. Thank you, Vincent, for, for all those prizes. <laughs> Maybe I can raise this a little. Do you think? Yeah. So I'm going to read a few poems from my last book, Planisphere. A few uh, recent poems and also uh, some translations of Rambeau, which will be published uh, next month, is Illumination, or Illuminations. Default mode. They were living in America at another time. They were living in America for the FBI. They were living in America shit wins. 
They were living in America on the border with Canada. They were living in America further gone into teats. They were living in America, that was the only good one. They were living in America, that was the only good one. They were living in America who answers the phone and they were living in America deliriously. They were living in America sadly. They were living in America fictitiously. They were living in America wedged. They were living in America Stella by starlight. They were living in America the mighty sun. They were living in America pandemically. They were living in America across from the Ritz Hotel. They were living in America getting their chops. They were living in America only for just one summer. They were living in America beside the lake. They were living in America for the defeatist troops. They were living in America for the pleasure of it all. They were living in America as well as can be expected. They were living in America as one grows passionately out of a love affair. They were living there every day. Does this donut remind you of a life preserver? They were living in America to remind you of me. They were living in America and a storm blew up suddenly. They were living in America extended terms of credit. They were living in America, but it's all over. They were living in America as tissue paper is to a comb. They were living in America at fives and sixes. They were living in America the same old, same old. Is my voice uh, coming through all right? Okay. The foreseeable future. And we just sat and dreamed, sailing around, trying to force the sad living of friends of every spilled government day. If I had perfect pitch, would I notice the buildup on that behind hand? Spray on sex, he botanized. That could never happen. He's being held by Egyptian matrons. He who loves and runs away. The bad news is the ship hasn't arrived. The good news is it hasn't left yet. It is still being loaded by natives with cone-shaped hats on their heads. Here come the transistors, bananas, durian, a fruit said to have a noxious smell, baby bottles, photocopiers, and souvenirs, such glorious ones, nothing useful except keychains, lockets to be furnished, a ball to stuff with life. Yet it's hard not to imagine the loss. I think, though I can't be sure, that all this is being added to my bill. Woe betide us. We shall never pay, though, not in a million years. Everything is promise. Too late we acted outside the rhymes required. Honest, God-fearing, ass-wearing blokes, eager to accept the hand that fate had dealt us and play with it. Now, brown sorrow is the correct livery for when we go out. It's important to find a copy of the reproduction and send or sell it back to them and with milk. That was the nicest thing about them, happy birthday. For it, you got a mandate. Because I like it better here, near the core. You are sitting on the sofa, have a glass of something. You will hear a city. The logistics. Then tomorrow, then tomorrow, we'll travel. The day will be a scorcher, some say. Travel beyond the rocks to a taped place some will recognize. Others not so much, some not at all. What place is this? 
to come back for a few hours to a city of 20,800 people, all good citizens, stout in work and doing, washed over by a wave. They keep ducking, imagining. It doesn't dovetail with the middle of the beginning. The time we lost getting here, the few friends who stayed with us, faithful to the ends of Franz. Some beginning they puked and get us out of here. We're magicians too. Sorry, it doesn't balance out the way they dressed and traveled past the farthest signs, in fact, to explore as none then knew. Sorry, it's raining. Even if you like the rain, it's raining somewhere, nowhere you can see. And the people, they've left too, wedged in a fucking dream. Lost sonnet. They grow up too fast these days. Unassumingness becomes unwieldy, unwieldy. The woods, a place to walk from briskly. You say your cunning comportment is artless. Well then, so am I for containing you, champ. Your tracks are alive with new interest. The trail always sees what's up ahead, which is resistance. No tooth or star contradicts what is made and hard to screw up. Wash the guest's feet, the aviator. Jack was his name, and we were like brothers, though we never knew each other. More of what happened. The mild stars shone for us, moving toward the decorative fire escape, seeking a tower to escape the sun above the roiling city. Surely it was for you and me. The unexpectedness of our music flooded us early. There were two ways about it. Man abandoned by his hopes drums a little life into the countryside. Then the periods collapse. From our rising up to our going down, everybody was nice. Favors overwhelmed us for a little while. Days subsided as patient crowds looked on. No space here for losers, or even what passes as successful in flyover states. In Fort Wayne, rubber cement was growing tacky. Silhouettes criticized their want of substance. Aida and Don Jose, thoughtful along the parapet, communicate. Do you chew gum? I suppose so. Do you believe in long engagements? It'll be better, a better day. Yes, and when all dreams come up for renewal, wiser to seek the unknown in the interior at its last address. Familiarity like that is forged over decades, separating the silence from the talkies, the savanna from the brush. One was encouraged into intimacy. Ideas started that way like froth at first. Then we flirted with something downhill. Pernilla, this is a, a woman's name. And as I've recounted before, this was in the New Yorker. And I had a lot of trouble with their infamous fact-checking department because they wanted to know who Pernilla was. I, I said it, it was, it's a woman's name. But that wasn't enough. <laughs> Please don't apologize for pissing me off. You were probably right, and, and I was halfway out the door anyway, the living room door leading to the hall and all it contains. How is it that things can get shiny and be peeling simultaneously? Seriously, Pa, we would have come over if we'd knowed the combination for long, 
and then folks that have pointed toward us miming birdsong and the like. It was too short a time to have wrapped many pensées in, but we weren't blighted by that near the tower. One who calls in need out of the dusk fancied our situation, but we were not to be perturbed by that, only a little fluted toward day's indisputable margin. I say, how do you like it? And the bills floating along beside it, like baby ducks after the mother has moved on to some important barrier that will rise up like a chapter heading in later life when all is pretty much paved over and weeds have begun to take hold. I said, how long do you expect it and us to go on nourishing whatever it is we do nurture? Madness, you implied, to get so near the torrent and not stumble, taking all things together. And we do do that, just don't advertise it. Come back another day and I'll have forms for you with the prices, as well as samples held close to the waist. That sure was fun the day we took our gum out and the trees lurched overhead. It was almost like being in a storm with no clouds around to blame it on. Yes, well, I imagined other settings for our unease than this. Now I'm mortified. No, you're not, she says. Pick up here where it says lost and join the boys in the harbor. Whether they have water wings or not, just bare chest bones boring through the gloom and you lean up against one whose sister is in Arcady and it plops the question just like that, you old so-and-so, and needs must be gone in any case though the hour isn't urgent and the land mass teeters once more, crashing out of gloaming onto the floor near your heels. And this one is a collage poem made up entirely of movie titles, which I lifted almost intact from the index of um, Leonard Maltin's uh, guy, film guide. They, they knew what they wanted. They all kissed the bride. They all laughed. They came from beyond space. They came by night. They came to a city. They came to blow up America. They came to rob Las Vegas. They dare not love. They died with their boots on. They shoot horses, don't they? They go boom. They got me covered. They flew alone. They gave him a gun. They just had to get married. They live. They loved life. They live by night. They drive by night. They knew Mr. Knight. They were expendable. They met in Argentina. They met in Bombay. They met in the dark. They might be giants. They, ma they made me a fugitive. They made me a criminal. They only kill their masters. They shall have music. They were sisters. They still call me Bruce. They won't believe me. They won't forget. I could point out that the movie They Made Me a Fugitive is the same film as They Made Me a Criminal. One, it's an English movie, which I saw only recently after I wrote this or copied it. And uh, it's, it's, it's very good. <laughs> it, uh, I think the English title is They Made Me a Fugitive, and that was Apparently a no-no for the American public. They had to change fugitive to criminal to avoid offending fugitives, apparently. <laughs> or somebody. <laughs> Here's a, another movie-derived poem, The Tower of London, also the title of a movie, as you'll see. The Tower of London isn't really a tower. It's a square building with towers at each of the four corners. In the 30s, they made a movie of it starring Boris Karloff as Mord, the executioner, who dabbled in torture. A busy man was Mord. His boss, Richard III, was demanding. Richard had no hump on his back, but Boris had a club foot as though to make up for it. Richard drowned the Duke of Clarence, whose name wasn't Clarence, 
in a tub of Malmsey, a sweet-tasting wine. Clarence had stood in his way. Richard was determined to kill all who stood in his way, including the princes in the tower, two little boys, practically infants, the son of old Henry VI, or maybe of Richard's half-brother, Edward, played by Ian Hunter. Richard was played by Basil Rathbone, who also played Sherlock Holmes. The princes, also named Richard and Edward, I believe, hadn't done anything. They didn't deserve to be killed. But then none of them did, including old Henry VI, although he was quite dotty at the time. Richard's bride was unlike the queen in the play Richard III. She was played by Barbara O'Neill, who played Scarlett O'Hara's mother in Gone with the Wind, though she wasn't old enough to be. That's the way I remember it. Wait, she was actually Edward's wife. Richard took unto him the Lady Anne, who was played by Nan Gray, though she actually married Wyatt, John Sutton, after they escaped from the tower or the castle. In the end, Richard killed just about everybody except Maud, who got thrown off a cliff by somebody, a fitting end to a miserable career. The winemakers. It wasn't meant to stand for what it stood for. Only a pup tent could do that. Besides, we were in a state called New York, where only bees made sense. Those who were with us were not with us and deserved a spanking. Others looking out over the bay's mild waters could barely distinguish a message made of logs Return to the frontier or all is lost, though in time some may reap the benefit and glory of a frozen attitude. My mind was made up. We would start for Illinois that very day. Have you considered firecrackers? The deft music contained therein assuages all contenders. Those who arrived last at the party received the most intelligent door prizes. My niece is in Nepal. My name was memorized last week for the chilling rolls to come, in which foot soldiers gasp, giggle, and dream. Say this for warmer climes, though. Bears are let out at night to patrol the streets. In the morning, hope flushes the city anew. I guess it was just that I always thought of snow at the wrong times, and defeatism came charging through the barricades. It always knew where to find me. Funny, few can now remember how water came in pails once and sails were free for anyone who needed them for a boat. Besides this, six different types of student were always shackled to the end of the wharf in case anybody could use them for anything. I think there's a wind mask out near the glue factory. So many kinds of hope began the race. Some morphed into local interest along the way. Others discharged family and civic responsibilities. Each of us was assigned a particular task, though none realized it until the task was accomplished and forgotten. The brouhaha of learning didn't seem to affect some any more than it did their teachers, by now asleep. Night was soft for that sort of thing. You remember the one, the little electrical villages down the road. I'll have a mustard coke. In ordinary times, a store can find that. Ah, but we live in a peculiar era. You can't get from there to here. Well, now it's something I'd be happy to write about. It lands on your roof, a small package, loved and warmed. For all your posturing, you'd say so too, I'd wager. Well, that's enough of that now. Better stack our hats in the cloud chamber. Her magical bracelet opened suddenly as though it were Christmas. We'd better be getting along before it gets dark or there's no way out of the box. They don't carry them anymore. Besides which, there's not much interest. Only songs of the night and fruits so beautifully presented, you'd swear you were in Asia the time before this one, whatever it is, or where we fetched up in the last century, the recent one, I mean. Like a dance, it completed itself and ran out 
hey, it was just here. So it is with the things that were more or less dear to us and are now enfolded in the dream of their happening. A man comes to the end of the drive, looks around. No one sees him. He putters, and in the end is the last to leave. We may write about him or how his walk affected us. There he goes again. If tact is a mortal sin, we shall not miss words to that effect. The drive down was smooth, but after we arrived, things started to go haywire. First one thing and then another. The days scudded past like tumbleweed, slow then fast, then slow again. The sky was sweet and plain. You remember how it still it was then, a season putting its arms into a coat and staying unwrapped for a long, a little time. It was during the week we talked about infrastructure, how sad that everything has to change, yet what a relief too. Otherwise we'd only have looking forward to, look forward to. The moment would be a bud that never filled, only persevered in a static trance before it came to be no more. We'd walked a little way in our shoes, one of the exploding hatfish erupted offshore. I was sure you'd remember how it had been the other time before the messenger came to your door and seemed to want to peer in and size up the place. So each evening became a forbidden morning of thunder and curdled milk, though the invoices got forwarded and birds settled on the tree. A voice from the fireplace. Like a wind-up denture in a joke store, fate approaches, leans quietly, let's see. There was moreover meaning in the last clause, meaning we couldn't equate from what was happening to us down the block. We approached with some hesitancy, let I dare not wait upon I would. Wasn't it April? Weren't things more likely to last in this or any season? Rhymes we like, more than rhythm. They provide a life preserver for embarrassing sorties. Um, someday we'll be grown up too. The desk lights not cancel the barge as it approaches the corner of avenues. Well, we sweated that out. It amounts to self-importance. Whether the sea is a vernacular one, only heroes can describe. Why don't you pluck me one? Seems they all rushed to the other side of the deck, causing alarm. Wind shriveled the rags that were left. Hold on a minute, and we'll get you aloft. No sense taking up time with vellum sunsets, he hears, and cannot stay. The whitish, gluey smell of the forest imbibes our earnings in a dream. Egg whites dry at room temperature. In my mature moments, I was robotic like you, but never canceled my interest. We all attempt starting out, yet few undergo the first few days of orientation lightly, which is funny. I mean, with so many around to project enlightenment or entertainment. If you live in a Wren house, you'll quickly understand what I mean. That, needless to say, was the last time I heard from them. I continue to get their flyers in the mail, but the project remains uninhabited. Flowers and goats cram the entrance with something you can see over. The vanilla sea propels itself lightly forward, ever in quest of spectators. But you can only do so much in the way of self-formation. I hadn't expected it to be otherwise, yet it doesn't seem right. Neither is it unjust, only pro forma. Nights imply seasons and much in the way of impish narrative. While in daylight, it's a matter of getting flush with the pavement. Don't forget to check every box on the front door and leave change for the milkman. Too bad they spotted us. 
Like I say, no jury will ever convict he or I. Off you go then. An egg is a puzzle, a tree, a piece of that puzzle. I've had a pleasant but uneven time. My helpmates could aver as much. Let us know how much we owe you. The balloon is ascending above ferns, teacup, teacup chimneys, striped stockings. So long training wheels. I'm gone for three weeks at a time. This one is called Three Weeks. Desperate asks, how driven batty by climate change can we not make out a stranger's silhouette in the dooryard? How can I lick some calendars where somnolent shepherds bear witness while porcelain nymphs conjugate somebody else's irregular verb? I'm still not in anti-personnel mode, yet that gigolo's DNA is all over the doorposts, from mudroom to powder room. They were early as usual. Can't you guys ever be late, we wondered. The one wouldn't necessarily want that either. Arriving in one piece, jaded, is enough for some. Not to be slimed by the lake or weather or accounted for by the bruising wind may be all it takes to recover from a weekend's erosion. If you take into consideration the snobbery that lets us breathe happily in pairs, for sure we'll have traversed a veranda's worth of elegies or epics. Let it mean something. You mean in other ways that changed our lives? Something of that, I says. Is that why clouds withered scrappily and no tune finally approved its margins? Fringed with decay all along it was, and if who knew better than ourselves, somber, asides, they wouldn't bet on it. But I was a child here for a long time. I even learned to read by the glare from that mud factory, fumed and hectored hostile witnesses, and so sailed down with evening to be done with penances, haphazard scraps of truth on beauty's trash heap. I'd do it again in a moment, offered the chance, but luck seldom cometh our way twice, ye gods. We serve two masters, Haddock and Bream, while crumbs muster stingily at our lips. It was a day like any other, torn from the register. And this one is called Postlude and Prequel. Would I lie to you? I don't know what to say to you. And the season is coming into season just now with long-awaited words from back when we were friends and still are, of course, but the tides pursue their course each day. Perturbing elements listen in the wings which are coming apart at the seams. Is it all doggerel and falderall, a cracked knowledge, monkey journalism? This is better than the other overlooked good that dried up a while back in whispers. The results, if any, won't last too much longer, and I, meanwhile, am on the way to correct you about the tickets and their availability. We pitch and stiffen, elbowed by traffic mysteriously descending the other lane of the avenue as lamps burst in many benched Central Park. I'll read a couple of the uh, uh, translation of Rambo's illuminations or illumination. This is a, this book will be published, uh, I believe, next month. I have the proofs here, which I'm reading from.
Well, this is the first uh, one. Uh, I, I actually translated this a number of years ago, and only a couple of years ago did, get, did I decide to translate the whole thing after an editor uh, approached me about translating something or, or other, and I remembered Illumination and decided to go ahead and do the whole thing. After the flood, or après le déluge, no sooner had the notion of the flood regained its composure than a hare paused amid the gorse and trembling bellflowers and said his prayer to the rainbow through the spider's web. Oh, the precious stones that were hiding the flowers that were already peeking out. Stalls were erected in the dirty main street and boats were towed toward the sea, which rose in layers above as in old engravings. Blood flowed in Bluebeard's house, in the slaughterhouses, in the amphitheaters, where God's seal turned the windows livid. Blood and milk flowed, the beavers built, tumblers of coffee steamed in the public houses. In the vast, still-streaming house of windows, children in mourning looked at marvelous pictures. A door slammed, and on the village square, the child waved his arms, understood by veins and weathercocks everywhere in the dazzling shower. Madame XXX established a piano in the Alps. Mass and First Communions were celebrated at the cathedral's 100,000 altars. The caravans left, and the Splendide Hotel was built amid the tangled heap of ice flows in the polar night. Since then, the moon has heard jackals cheeping in time deserts and eclogues in wooden shoes grumbling in the orchard. Then, in the budding purple forest, Eucharist told me that spring had come. Well up, pond, foam, roll on the bridge and above the woods, black cloths and organs, lightning and thunder, rise and roll, waters and sorrows, rise and revive the floods. For since they subsided, oh, the precious stones shoveled under and the full-blown flowers so boring. And the queen, the witch who lights her coals in the clay pot, will never want to tell us what she knows and which we do not know. This is one of two poems called Cities, uh, which is apparently based on Rambo's impressions of London, where he, he actually spent more time than he ever did in, in Paris. The official Acropolis beggars the most colossal conceptions of modern barbarity, impossible to express the dull light produced by the perpetually gray sky, the imperial glint of the barrack-like buildings, the eternal snow on the ground. With a singular taste for enormity, they have reproduced all the classical marvels of architecture. I attend art exhibitions in spaces 20 times vaster than Hampton Court, and what paintings? A Norwegian Nebuchadnezzar commissioned the staircases of the ministries. Even the flunkies that I was able to glimpse are more haughty than Brahma's, and I shuddered at the colossal aspect of the caretakers and construction officials. Thanks to the ordering of buildings into squares, courtyards, and enclosed terraces, cab drivers have been kept out. The parks represent primitive nature detailed with superb technical mastery. The upper zone has inexplicable parts. An arm of the sea with no boats unrolls its layer of blue sleet between caves weighted with giant candelabra. A short bridge leads to a vaulted passage directly beneath the dome of the Sainte Chapelle. This dome is an armature of artistically wrought steel, approximately 15,000 feet in diameter. At several points on the copper footbridges, the platforms, the stairways that wind around covered markets and pillars, I thought I could judge the depth of the city. 
It's the wonder of it that I was unable to seize. What are the relative levels of the other districts above or below the Acropolis? For today's tourist orientation is impossible. The business district is a circus built in a uniform style with arcaded galleries. No shops to be seen, but the snow on the pavement is trampled. A few nabobs as rare as, as Sunday morning strollers in London are making their way toward a diamond-studded stagecoach. A few red velvet divans, they serve Arctic beverages whose price varies from 800 to 8,000 rupees. To the suggestion that we seek out a theater in this circus, I would reply that the shops must contain dramas that are sorted enough. I think there is a police force, but the laws must be so strange that I give up trying to imagine what the rogues here must be like. The suburb, as elegant as any fine street of Paris, has the advantage of air that is like light. The democratic element is comprised of some hundred souls. Here, too, the houses don't follow one another. The suburb loses itself bizarrely in the countryside, the county that fills up the eternal west of forests and prodigious plantations where savage gentlefolk hunt down their gossip columns by artificial light. Well, shall I do one more? Okay, I will. Uh, promontory. Golden dawn and tremulous evening find our brig offshore facing this villa and its dependencies which form a promontory as vast as Epirus and the Peloponnesus or the great island of Japan or Arabia. Temples lit up by returning processions, immense vistas of the fortifications of modern coastlines, dunes illustrated with warm flowers and bacchanals, Grand Canals of Carthage and embankments of a louche Venice, languid eruptions of Etnas and fissures of flowers and water in glaciers, public wash houses surrounded by German poplars, slopes of singular parks inclining the tops of Japanese cherry trees, the circular facades of the Royal and the Grand in Scarborough or Brooklyn, and their railways flank tunnel under and overhang the appointments of this hotel, chosen from the history of the most elegant and colossal structures of Italy, America, and Asia, whose windows and terraces, presently awash with decorative lighting, drinks, and lush breezes, are open to the minds of travelers and noblemen, which, during the daytime hours, allow all the tarantellas of the coast, and even the ritornellos of celebrated veils of art to decorate wondrously the facades of the Promontory Palace. Thank you. Thank you.